Okay. Welcome to the Friday session of the DIS meeting. Um, we are on the hour. This is the session with two presentations on the high luminosity LHC. Uh, it's a standard uh, model physics to a large extent. Uh, uh, so we will have two talks. One is uh, on QCD electroweak physics and particularly the top. While the second talk then carves out the X physics part. So let's not lose any time here. Uh, the rules are clear 50 minutes for the presentation, uh, sorry, 20 minutes for the presentation and, and 10 minutes discussion. And I will raise my voice after 50 minutes or so to give a warning. The first uh, speaker is Simona Pagel Criso from LPL. And uh, Simona, you have your slides up already. Please start. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. It's, it's nice to be here and kick off this, um, this session on features prospects. And so uh, today on behalf of Atlas and CMS, I will tell you a little bit about the prospect of GCD electroweak and top physics at the luminosity LHC. And so uh, just to give you an idea as an outline, I'll, uh, I'll just give you a very brief introduction the, on the eyes of the future of the high energy physics um, and the luminosity LHC. Uh, just quickly glance it through the Atlas and CMS defector subgrades without having the time to make justice to a pretty extended program. And then uh, I'll go through some highlights of uh, physics prospects for the luminosity LSC. Uh, won't be able to cover all the material available uh, and will not even attempt that, but there is a lot of references for further reading and some extra information in backup if you're curious. Okay, so let me uh, just get started and um, um, as, as probably most of you are aware, there are several planning exercises been, being carried out in these years uh, by various areas. Uh, notably, there has been a European strategy planning, uh, which resulted in uh, many documents out of which uh, I link here the physics briefing book that concluded in 2020. And currently there is a SNOMAS planning exercise that is ongoing and uh, will be leading to the so-called P5 recommendations. And uh, here you will hear much more about this, uh, especially the European strategy in a report uh, um, just uh, uh, less than a couple of hours from now in this session. Um, so in the context of SNOMAS, there will be also new results coming out from Atlas and CMS, new projections. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the expectation comes from the uh, letter of interest that were submitted in this NOMAS process to collaboration. And so uh, throughout the presentation, I've flagged as coming soon some of these results that you will be able to see uh, hopefully within the next year. And here you can see just a, a sketch of the various uh, of this uh, US, US and European planning exercise and how they interleave between each other which I think is, is, is nice to show you a little bit about the time scales. And of course, the, none of this is, is done in isolation. These days are really global efforts and, and there is strong interplay between similar exercises uh, in other regions and countries as well. Okay, but uh, uh, the high luminosity LHC in, in, in general is really the only future high energy collider we are certain to build. Um, is expected to operate from about 2027 until uh, at least 2036 with two long shutdowns in between. And here you can see a timeline with the start of where we are and a compressed timeline from when uh, high luminosity LHC will start. Uh, we are talking about an, uh, a machine with a, a center of mass energy 14 TV and a luminosity from five to seven at 10 to the 34 inverse square centimeter per second. Uh, which corresponds to a pileup of, of 140, which we call the baseline, uh, to uh, up to 200 in the ultimate scenario. To, and we'll aim to collect per experiment three to four inverse optoband. So most of the projections that I will show today are from the so-called high luminosity CERN yellow report that was submitted as input to the European strategies. And other CMS has often similar projections. So I will basically pick one or another just as an exemplification, but I will reference all of them in the upper left quadrant of the slide. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, there is a vast upgrade program that um, both other CMS has undertaken to simultaneously address challenges of a national environment and increase the capabilities of the present detectors. Essentially, all major systems have been, will be upgraded. 
Uh, and here you can see just uh, in a very quick glance uh, uh, the links of, of various TDRs. We'll have all an old new silicon tracker spot experiments, uh, upgrading the trigger sector. Uh, new for a luminosity LC will have very precise timing detectors. And uh, um, we'll also have uh, significant upgrading the calorimeters part and the electronics of the immune spectrometers. And so I cannot make justice to this vast upgrade program, but I wanted to show at least a couple of, um, a glance in a couple of plots, in particular for the inner tracker, uh, one notable thing that will be very relevant for the uh, standard model measurements that I'm going to show is that the inner tracker acceptance is extended from 2.5 to 2 about 4. And uh, then uh, in the case of CMS, the inner tracker will be used very early on in the, in the trigger as well, uh, up to level 1, and can, the, the information will be able to be combined with other subsystems uh, very early. Um, the bottom left shows just uh, the moment, the expected momentum resolution, which with the improved tracker is, uh, is going to be um, better than the current one. And then in addition, we'll have also, as I mentioned, timing detector and uh, uh, that you can see, for instance, on the left, in the other side, there will be a forward timing detector used to suppress further pileups. So this is an example of sub extra suppression for pileup jets. And on the right, you see uh, just one example of very nice upgrade that CMS is pursuing uh, for a forward calorimeter, which has included timing information and very segmented granularity, such that it would be able to have a pointed resolution, uh, which uh, can reach up to few milliradians, which is pretty outstanding. And uh, Corinne will say much more about, a little bit more about the uh, upgrade in the next talk. So you will hear a few more highlights. But let me uh, spend a minute to, to uh, guide you through what uh, the projections you will see, uh, how they are derived. There are essentially different mechanisms that we've been using to make projections that run from using full simulations with Gen4 and all the experiment software to assess and optimize performance of the reconstructed object in details. Um, these are very resource consuming, so it's unlikely you will see there are very few cases where we derive a full physics projection out of this, but all the objects are studied using these full simulations. Then we have fast simulation that are usually parameterized detector performance or fast reconstruction using Delphi's. These allow re-optimization of the selection uh, with respect to the current analysis, uh, usually at the, price, at the price to having a simplified data analysis compared to the current run to analysis. Uh, but they are a very powerful method to take into account improvements on the detector side. And then we have extrapolation from existing run to analysis, where, of course, only minor tweaks are possible on the analysis selections, uh, but they manage to capture the full complexity of the analysis and are better suited in cases where the improvements of the detector will play uh, a relatively minor role compared to the very complicated data analysis strategy. And one thing that has been uh, um, than a lot of emphasis on has been the treatment of systematic uncertainties. This has been harmonized between experiment and there has been quite a, uh, a large effort to extrapolate uh, what would be the ultimate systematic uncertainties for uh, various measurements at the luminosity LC. And there have been several guiding principles that have been followed and assumptions. In particular, the, um, for the statistical uncertainty, the data scales, of course, with the square root of luminosity. While we assume that uh, uncertainty in terms of like limitation of the number of the simulated events will essentially be a problem that we manage to solve. It's not uh, yet solved, but uh, we, we assume that we'll be able to solve and we'll require R&D for that. Uh, the intrinsic detector limitation for, um, for current uncertainty will remain constant or updated depending on the detector upgrades. And the theory uncertainties are tentatively halved, assuming that we'll have improvements in the theory calculation. There also has been a very nice analysis of how PDF uncertainty will scale. And so those will lead to some scenarios uh, which uh, have been used in the projection that I'm showing. And finally, um, obviously, all the projection will uh, uh, are based on methods, on data analysis methods that are used now. So inherently for analysis that have complicated uh, analysis method and can profit heavily from that, um, some of this, uh, some of this projection will, will be conservative. And the table just shows you again the various balance of, uh, of this different type of simulation and their aspects. Okay, 
But let me let me then dive into a little bit the physics we expect to see at the end of the luminosity, let's see. So um, starting from jets and photons, the table on the right shows you a little bit the reach of uh, various cross sections that will be done, of course, differentially. Um, in, uh, in inclusive jet for inclusive photon, B jets, W boson decay hadronic and top quarks. You can, you can see that each of them will reach multi TV ranges, pushing the boundary of what we can uh, do now. Um, in, in this particular projection, so you can see an example on the bottom right for the inclusive chat, just to give an idea. But for this example, for this projection, there was particular care in estimating the spectral size of the systematics and the effect on the measurements. Um, so the bottom left shows you an example on the B tagging uncertainty, where really each component has been extrapolated, understanding what could be improved and what uh, will stay as a as a. Uh, limitations, and then uh, the um, and then also the interplay with the PDF knowledge and the sensitivity constraint PDF have been studied. So you can see an example in the central plot. And here again, I put this coming soon new analysis. I will not go through them, but uh, I wanted to mention. Um, moving to electroweak physics, one of the first uh, very high profile analysis is W mass measurements. This is because the indirect constraints are still more accurate the direct measurement that you see in the plot on the right. And uh, this is a systematics dominated measurement where PDF uncertainties play a key role. So the aluminosity LSC, we plan to take advantage of the improved detector, but collecting data also at low pileup, so in special runs. Uh, this allows us to use optimal reconstruction for the missing transverse momentum. And the extended rapidity range especially gives is, is a key reading in a reducing PDF uncertainty, being able to reconstruct forward leptons. And so the, the projection is done assuming only statistical PDF uncertainty as, as the main component. And you can see in the bottom left, the expected sensitivity depending on how much luminosity will collect at these low mu uh, values. And the table shows uh, the situation of per 200 in the speed cover, which should be a, a very reasonable target. And you can see also the effect of the improved uh, ETA coverage. So we get to, uh, to, to levels of, of um, uh, about 12 MeV of uncertainty, which is pretty impressive. And, and it basically starts to be very close to the indirect uh, constraints we have currently. Uh, another, uh, another observable is the weak mixing angle. This is measured using forward background asymmetry in dilapton production at the C resonances. You can see an example of the expected asymmetry versus the invariant mass of the lapton for various rapidity regions. This um, again is, uh, is heavily dependent on uh, PDF uncertainty and it can be used to constrain PDF. Um, and the, the extended and it does the extended lepton acceptance uh, a large eta and the large statistics really play an important role. Um, so the expected sensitivity shown again on the expansion of the luminosity on the left, where you can also see where uh, um, PDF uncertainty essentially that uh, are, are shown um, in uh, in red start even constrained by the measurement starts to be dominant. Uh, after about one inverse up to burn and the statistical uncertainty will become subdominant. And on the right, you can see the projected uncertainty assuming the same central value of the current measurement, how that will shrink compared to the, to the current one. Um, okay, uh, I have to uh, first, uh, as I said, pick some highlights. So one, another topic I wanted to highlight, which I think is very interesting will be the um, the, the, the quarty gauge coupling constraints. And in particular for quarty gauge coupling, there are three main classes of process that we can use to study uh, quarty gauge coupling in LEC. Uh, there is exclusive production, there is uh, diboson production in association with forward jets and a rapidity gap among them. And then there are processes involving uh, triboson productions, which are very rare. So these are all very rare processes with very uh, small cross sections. And in fact, the first evidence of a process involving direct, directly quartic edge coupling has only been, um, has only happened at the very end of run one. But since then, the field has been growing very fast using run two data. So here's a screenshot of just some of the papers that have come out in the run two. We have the first observation of same charge WW, WZ, ZZ, tribosons. Um, evidence of specific triboson processes and C-gamma, and uh, the first observation of exclusive production of WW. So this is really a booming uh, field 
that uh, really, where really the luminosity LSC will allow to study these processes in details. And uh, the um, and I want just to show you a few examples, uh, uh, starting from vector boson scattering, uh, where you have two uh, vector bosons in association to two jets, um, and focusing on leptonic decay of these vector bosons. Um, the, the, the large statistics allows to uh, differential measurement also for the very rare processes. So the case of, for instance, of the uh, ZZJJ, where the Z or HC decays leptonically. This is, of course, a very rare process. Both the CC production itself is rare. And then, then if you account for the branching ratios, the cross the expected cross section is very small. But you can see on the right, uh, the expected differential cross-section measurement where you can say with the expected uncertainty at the bottom, where you can see essentially we will be able to measure to have a pretty good differential measurement even in these rare cases. And then uh, uh, the other important part is of course to study the sensitivity on longitudinally polarized uh, uh, vector boson scattering, which is very sensitive to standard to delicate standard model cancellations and so can constrain uh, effective operators beyond the standard model very well. Um, the, um, we expect enough sensitivity to actually be able to observe such phenomena in the same sign uh, WW, longitudinal polarized scattering. This is shown, for instance, in the middle plot, which shows the sensitivity despite the significance of such, for such a process versus luminosity. And you see you will get uh, combining two experiments, so assuming a, uh, 6,000 inverse pentobarn, we should be able to get to evidence of this process. And then the left plus, uh, plot shows you an example of um, analysis that uses uh, the angular distribution of lapton WC uh, production to study the longitudinally polarized scattering and separate it from the uh, transversely polarized one. Um, Simon, we have five minutes left. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, additionally, we can look at hadronically decayed uh, diboson uh, in association with jets. And this is example was done looking at hadronically decayed uh, WSC boson to probe very large energy, uh, very large um, center of mass energy of the parton parton scattering. Um, and this was done both in the resolved and the boosted regime, that, that especially the boosted regime that allows you to push really to access the large center of mass energy, the parton parton. So here the backgrounds are very severe, so we need multivariate techniques to really separate signal from backgrounds, but we expect better than 5% accuracy on the electroweak production of this diboson cross-section when combining different final state. And also it's been studied the sensitivity to triboson processes, and the table below shows you the expected uncertainty uh, on the cross-section, the inclusive cross-section, where that shows that we'll be able to measure uh, separately each of these triboson production modes, which is quite impressive. Um, I also wanted to spend a minute talking about forward physics because the, the, the central exclusive production mechanism offer quite unique probe standard model. This is uh, depicted in the, in the diagram on the upper right, where essentially you have a colorless exchange between protons and the protons remain intact and a center, central system X is produced. Um, what the primary example is, the one I showed you a couple of slides ago, where you have gamma gamma to WW, so the X is uh, uh, two W bosons. And uh, recently CMS expressed interest in a new, in a new near beam proton spectrometer able to uh, detect these scattered protons from these processes. Um, the, this, 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 this spectrometer will consist in timing plus tracking detectors, and there will be three or four stations. So the, the different location access essentially have different acceptance uh, uh, on the invariant mass of the system because of the angle of the scattering of the protons. So you can see the acceptance versus the, uh, the mass uh, on the bottom plots for one particular uh, configuration. But the, uh, the, 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 really the main bottom line is that the first three station allow you to access the very high mass regime at, at as low as down to 100, 133 GB. And to access 6 physics, 6, you need an extra station a bit further away at 420 meters. Um, there was also, um, this also had implication on the, on the beam crossing angle, and this was a nice study, in, uh, and finally the suggestion from CMS to adopt a vertical beam crossing angle was adopted for a luminosity LSC. And also here I wanted to say just Atlas is also exploring the opportunities for the forward detector luminosity LSC. I don't have anything to show you so far. 
And then here are just a couple of examples of acceptance studies that have been done in this context. So here you can see various cross sections just to give an order of magnitude for processing exclusive production. And uh, I will not go into detail, but uh, as an example for the gamma gamma WW in the bottom right, this shows you for events that have two protons tagged in this expected mu spectrometer, the sensitivity to anomalous couplings and how they will uh, show up uh, depending on, the, on, the, on essentially the um, center of mass energy. Okay, finally, in the, my last minute, I wanted to quickly cover uh, top work physics. Um, the, the large statistics will allow precision of double, in terms of double differential cross section, for instance, in the environment mass of the uh, TT bar pair and rapidity. Um, and uh, this will profit not only by the large statistic, but also the extended eta range. And here you can see some of this impressive projection where it shows a very, um, very uh, low uncertainty all the way to very high rapidities that were not otherwise accessible so far. Um, and in fact, you can see the, a comparison uh, depending on the, on the rapidity acceptance. And, on, and the central plot shows you also the constraint on PDF uncertainty we can have from these measurements. And also there are techniques that, uh, uh, for instance, top mass measurement using uh, TT bar laptop as jets with a JPSI that exploit the correlation in this case of the mass of the top and the mass of the left and the side to constrain the mass of the top. These require large statistics and these, for instance, we are able to, pre, to, um, to measure a, a top mass with a quite, um, quite impressive accuracy for this type of method. And, uh, and of course, the large statistics allows you to access very rare processes. So including four top cross sections with uh, uh, 10 to 30 percent uncertainty, depending on the assumptions. Uh, we already have evidence of this process for round two, so I think honestly, uh, more sophisticated methods will probably outperform even these projections. And then the rare processes of uh, TT barring associated with other objects like uh, CW bosons or a photon that uh, uh, you can see here how, how the uncertainty on these measurements and differential cross section will be able to be performed. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusions. So the Atlas CMS upgrades brings uh, a robustness as well as new feature to the, for the Illuminance of the LSC. There is a large data set that will allow precision differential measurements of process that we barely can observe or haven't observed yet. And uh, obviously many of these projections tend to inherently be conservative, but there has been, there has been a lot of significant effort in at least uh, harmonize assumption across the experiment and show the expected real importance of reducing systematics for the aluminous DLC. And overall, uh, aluminous DLC process really a vast and rich precision physics program. I've shown just a subset of the results. So I linked here the public pages of the dedicated public pages of the CMS on future prospects and more of physics projects are also coming in the context of SNOMAS. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Simona. Um, the talk is open for questions and uh, please raise your hands uh, so that we can go through the question in, in sequence. And while we're waiting for fingers to go up, uh, maybe I start with a question to Simona. Uh, in some sense, you have focused on the vector boson production, the quartic coupling and, and so yeah. on. Uh, but uh, well, if we go with the with the current day's uh, hot topics, uh, the leptons are also an area of interest. What is the capability of the detectors uh, with respect to lepton reconstruction these days? Are there improvements, momentum cutoffs, and, and the like? Yeah, no, that, it, you're right. That That's a pretty hot topic right now. Um, the main reason I haven't, we don't have, I, I think, a good physics projection that illustrates uh, at the best uh, the improvements in the detector in this sector. However, I can say a few words. Um, at the very beginning, I'm trying to go back, apologies, it's taking a second. At the very beginning, I was showing you um, the momentum resolution uh, as measured from, it, from the inner tracker for a single muon comparing, and then the bottom, you can see that in the bottom left, uh, which also has the combined run, run two. Um, where you can see that we have a slight improvement in the atlas compared to the current one. Um, a lot, of, of course, of the uh, of the upgrade in terms of lepton reconstruction in the central region 
are done to um, at least keep the current performances because the harsher pileup environment. However, there are, I think, significant improvements. And the two main things I wanted to mention, I think, is that uh, on the trigger side, we'll be able to lower single and dilapton PT thresholds, which is very non trivial considering the harsher environment. So we'll have lower thresholds, which, uh, which can help some, some of the physics cases quite a bit. And the second thing uh, that I wanted to mention is what I highlighted probably a lot throughout the talk is data acceptance, uh, which allows us to, to really um, reconstruct, uh, try to reconstruct forward leptons, especially forward electrons. Yeah, thank you, Simon. There is a question which I'm reading out loud here because yeah. the connection would not be adequate, namely on slide 17, if you can move forward to that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, on the top right, you have, you refer to the top quark measurements. And uh, the question is on the number of leptons in the final state. So how many leptons would that result in? And what is the proposed uh, measurement? Uh, this was Olga's question. So, so I guess, what? is it the, for the top quark mass, that's a lepton plus chat. So you uh, and uh, uh, so you have a single lepton from the uh, from the top, and then the two muons from the uh, from the one of the top decades on the W decays, and and then the two muons from the J side. And if it is on the rightmost plot, I I will I think that's also lepton plus jets. Yes, it's written also in the plot. That's also yeah, single lepton plus bottom, jets. Yeah. Yeah, and I hope this answers. Yeah. It's no, it, it, no, sorry. So it, it says L mu mu. So isn't that three leptons then? Um, for the JPE side, for the mass. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's three yeah. leptons because two are coming from the JPE side, and one is the usual mm -hmm. of the lepton budget. Yeah. Okay. And what was the advantage of um, doing this measurement? I, I didn't get it. Oh, for for uh, for using this method, uh, it, it basically well correlates to the to the uh, top mass that you use in the Monte Carlo. It's all about uh, the usual um, theoretical uncertainty, and then relating the observer that you measure to the actual uh, to 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 sort of the input of your Lagrangian and the input of your Monte Carlo mass. And this was produced. Uh, this was proposes one method that keeps under control some of the systematics. So it's, it has different type of systematics. Thank you. I don't, so I'm sure that there are, a, yeah. Basically you show the sensitivity to a range of top masses, if I can read, of six GeV between the, the uh, curves, right? That's... This is an example, yeah. This is an example. Okay, uh, are there further questions? I'm just trying to... Paul Newman and David and Terrier. Okay, Paul, please. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure whether this is for you or for the next speaker, but in, in the context of the forward physics program that you showed from yeah. CMS, with the PPS, uh, I mean, if you can have 420 meter stations, then, then it opens up Higgs, exclusive Higgs. That's program. correct. You know? So are that, you able that, to say anything uh, about you know what the prospects are for that? That so yeah, the, the, the main reason of this um, of this uh, 420 meter section is exactly to allow Higgs physics. There are studies on uh, acceptance to show uh, how you can reconstruct exclusive Higgs production. Um, it's they're very preliminary, so they're really just acceptance studies. There is, I um. The, the, the whole document came out recently, so I haven't uh, skimmed through. I only skimmed through all of it, uh, and it's 300 pages. So it's it's super interesting, by the way. Um, I don't remember. I, I remember there are acceptance studies for Higgs production. You, you, you are able to access that for exclusive Higgs production, but I don't remember on top of my head like the, the expected uncertainty on, uh, on that process, on cross-section measurement on that process. Okay, but I don't know if Corina like, remembers. It sounds like it's measurable. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it is, is measurable. Be a challenge. Yeah, it, yeah it, okay. I think it is measurable. But uh, uh, oh, hold on a second. I think I have. Yeah, you can see here 
at least in the table, the expected fiducial cross section. So that's already taken into account elastic only production mm -hmm. and uh, uh, protons being uh, in the acceptance of these forward proton detectors. Okay. Um, and so you see that with all the station inclusive the 420, the Higgs production has a cross section. <coughs> it's very tiny, 0 0.07 femtobar. But we are talking about three inverse subtuburn of data and uh, um, in a very clean environment in that sense. So I think that, okay. that's, that tells you a little bit the orders of magnitude. Yeah, let's move on to the last question. Okay. Sorry, Paul. Yes. <laughs> David um, is uh, also just. It's a very interesting yeah. topic. I agree. Yes. So can you hear me? Paul. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, just a, well, just a rapid comment on this thing. I mean, the H exclusive Higgs uh, is not something that has been. This has been studied for over 12 years. And the idea to install uh, Roman pot detectors at 420, this comes from 2008, and there are studies that go well beyond accepting uh, these uh, the plots. I mean, there is studies of background, of timing, of there are many, there is lots of work on this. This is not something new. There is lots of uh, work in the past on that I encourage the people to, to check. Anyway, let, let me go to my question. Can you go back to slide uh, nine? You mentioned in the context of jets and photons, you mentioned alpha S and DPS, and I'd like to see the connection here. Why do you mention uh, the strong coupling constant and also DPS on, on the const context of uh, jets and photons? No, so I, here it is not really the title. I, I should have put probably this into the uh, conclusion side. DPA, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning DPS is because there was a study to look at uh, uh, digit, pro digit production in the context of double part of scattering. Okay, that's why it's in this slide. And jet substructure again is just because it's looking into uh, uh, inclusive jet uh, and substructure of that. For alpha S, um, this I, 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 is it just a, is is the closest slide to let's say that is heavily connected to um, strongly produced processes, and that's why you ended up here in terms of like strong coupling. But it, it doesn't mean that, of course, is that's not the processes you use to study alpha S. <clears throat> well, actually, the closest hadronic process to determine alpha S is the inclusive top quark. Uh, cross-section and now also recently was proposed that inclusive W and C boson cross-sections at, uh, at LHC. Yeah, but and, as and you can are, imagine. You... But uh, those do not belong to the jets and photons. So I was wondering why you put it there. I simply did that, that again, I had to put it in one slide, putting in top, honestly, I think is misleading. Oh, okay, uh, point well taken. So uh, let's thank you, Simona. They, we have to move on as always, time is of essence here. And we, yeah, thank you for, for the nice presentation. And we should uh, clap our hands uh, while being frustrated <laughs> doing this virtually. Um, and then move on to the next talk, which is uh, Corinne Mills uh, from Chicago. And she will present uh, the Higgs uh, search and prospects. Good morning. Do you see my slides well? Yes, we do. Great. And uh, for the Exclusive Higgs, I remember seeing some of the early studies and wasn't aware of the high lumia LHC projections. So that's uh, that's very cool. Um, yeah, I had been very much looking forward to traveling to New York, but I am grateful and excited to still be able to present these results on a Higgs prospects for the high luminosity LHC. So the uh, high luminosity LHC is the you know, next collider phase we anticipate and comes with a very compelling Higgs case, uh, com compelling physics case. And, you know, along with the many interesting studies uh, Simona presented, there's a, uh, one of the main things we're aiming to do is to study the Higgs boson in much greater depth. Uh, there was relevant context in uh, Sally Dawson's talk earlier in the conference. And uh, I want to emphasize that the scalar sector is a very likely place for new physics to appear either in direct or indirect searches, and I'll talk about both. And uh, I'd like to quote her that we are just getting to the interesting regime in Higgs couplings. Both Atlas and CMS have invested in detector upgrades that will bring qualitatively new abilities to the experiments, as well as other improvements. And this will allow us to cope with the large amount of pileup resulting from up to 200 simultaneous proton-proton uh, collisions. 
And, but what we get for that price is an order of magnitude more integrated luminosity. So this will illuminate many measurements that have been until now limited by statistical uncertainties. And there is a just enormous body of work that has been done on projections for the high luminosity LHC. And so to try to give some focus to it, I'm going to focus on uh, connecting improvements to the detector upgrades. And I will try to highlight what different experimental factors are still you know, the limiting factors for our measurements. To give some highlights of the CMS phase two detector, the, um, we have a not, basically there's an overhaul of almost every component in the detector including track information at level one in the trigger, uh, upgraded electronics and granularity for the calorimeters. Uh, silicon is the active material in what's called the high granularity calorimeter for the end cap. Uh, for muons, there's a new detector technology that gems and increased trigger acceptance. We have a qualitative new capability in the MIP timing detector, which lets us timestamp particles. And finally, we'll have a total overhaul uh, of the silicon tracking detector including uh, smaller pixels, expanded pseudo-rapidity coverage, and a new geometry for the strips that enables uh, tracking information at level one. Uh, since I am personally been spending a lot of time on the pixel upgrade, I'm going to spend a, a couple slides on that. The focus here is on uh, improved radiation tolerance. There's the new RD53-based chip that uh, shares many common features between Atlas and CMS. It was a joint development procedure. There are many things uh, improved in the sensor design, uh, including examining a 3D uh, electrode configuration, thinner sensors, and there are still you know, some aspects that are under discussion. And in addition to that, we'll have more layers and finer granularity. So I have an illustration here of what the phase one pixel detector looks like. So we have four layers in the barrel. This is kind of, this is one of those classic cross sections through one quarter of the detector. Four layers in the barrel and three in the end cap, covering up to about 2.5 in pseudo rapidity, and the pixels are 150 by 100 microns squared. And this is the phase two detector. So you can see there's we still have the four barrel layers, and there's a lot more pixel layers, pixel disks in the forward. Uh, and um, the coverage is extended here out to eta 4.0. And now I superpose that we have six pixels where we used to have one to give a sense of the granularity. This is, uh, and although we are also discussing 50 by 50 pixels, that should be settled by the end of the year. And what is this bias in terms of physics? So we're gonna, I'm gonna step through what this, how this uh, gets, makes its way into an analysis. So we start from the tracking level in the upper left, and you can, this is the uh, resolution of the impact parameter, which feeds directly into B tagging. You can see that the red points for phase two move down from phase one, that's our improved resolution. That's a log plot, so that's not a trivial improvement. And you can see that there are red points further in eta than there were uh, our black points. That turns that can translate in turn into the uh, performance of the B tagger. So it's kind of a busy plot in the upper right, but I want to highlight that. Um, so in this rock curve, there are lots of different ones. In this one, uh, better means closer to the bottom right. The, uh, you can see the performance degrades a little bit with pileup, and this is separated in different bins of eta to give a idea of how this compares to our current performance. I updated, I uh, pulled up the current best current state of the art and marked that where the blue lines cross. So, um, and that's averaging over uh, eta. So it's a little bit different, difficult to make a direct comparison, but we are going to at least match and possibly beat the uh, phase, the current performance, and as well as adding new acceptance. And then the final piece of that puzzle is how we expect to do in the systematics. And you can see this in the bottom row. This, uh, you can see that we have improvements of up to 70% in the uncertainty on the B-jet tagging efficiency. And for the C-jet tagging efficiency, there's kind of a across the board 40 to 50% improvement. And this is, uh, I guess that's a 60% improvement. And so the bottom line here is that we have better performance and better precision. And this is just one example. I, this is true in many, many different areas of the upgrade. Uh, similarly, uh, Atlas has a lot of very similar upgrades to CMS with emphasis on the trigger, a new capability for timing, and a total overhaul of the tracker. Uh, 
as the old saying goes, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And uh, Simona had a very nice uh, exposition of this, so I won't belabor the point. We, uh, in order of increasing complexity, we scale the cross sections up, uh, scale the statistical uncertainties according to the integrated luminosity, the deta uh, detailed detector performance simulations to model all the different important model all the different improvements. And uh, finally, the systematic uncertainties are where a lot of the judgment comes in. These are you know, the human factor where, where we have to really think about our measurements and express the limitations of our techniques and knowledge through, through these error bars. And there are different approaches to kind of give an idea of how things may evolve. There are the current best values unchanged, this someone sometimes gets called S1. And then there was a consensus between Atlas and CMS so that their projections could be compared on an equal footing of the yellow report on quote unquote uncertainties, which sometimes get called S2. And this is a more optimistic scenario. Uh, launching into the physics part of the talk, uh, the uh, Higgs pair production is perhaps, you know, the most famous of the high Lumi LHC measurements. It's a, a clear example of something that's been statistically limited, but it's also of tremendous physics importance as it directly examines the shape of the Higgs potential. Uh, with its implications for electroweak baryogenesis. And it's interesting experimentally because of the multitude of final states. So uh, you, in the plot on the lower, uh, lower right, you see the different branching ratios. So in addition to all these, you know, all these channels, we have the, uh, in addition to, you know, all these decay channels, you have to have all the combinatorics of them. So the measurements tend to focus on the top left corner of this plot, the red and orange, because those are the ones that have a more have more data. But it's also the case that the channels with the highest branching ratio don't always dominate sensitivity. And this is because of systematics and or large backgrounds. And I'm going to already give you the, the bottom line here, which is that the experiments each expect are on average of our to see around three sigma evidence if the standard model is uh, true. And so uh, I highlight that, you know, Atlas has uh, BB Tau Tau as their most uh, performant channel and CMS is, has a BB Gamma Gamma. And um, finally, in, in the upper right, I have a Feynman diagram showing that a lot, of, a lot of these results are expressed in terms of a Kappa Lambda, which is the ratio of the measured, uh, the measured coupling to the standard model prediction. So the standard model value of that is one. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on the CMS and Atlas measurements here, picking on some interesting points. And in each case, I'm going to look at the uh, most sensitive channel. So CMS, the studies from CMS are primarily based on a, a parametric detector model, Delphi's. And the most sensitive analysis, uh, BB Gamma Gamma, uses a BDT classifier and it's a proceeds as a double resonance search. So I picked out the two uh, invariant mass plots from the most sensitive category. And you can see that the good resolution in the, in the photon invariant mass, diphoton invariant mass and dijet mass, the peak is broader. Um, and you can see that the main background, uh, which is actually also a very rare Higgs process, TTH Higgs to gamma gamma is evident in the blue peak under the red one. So that's quite a challenging measurement. It's a different kind of challenge than a 4B, which has a large multi-jet background and a substantial uncertainty on that estimate. So the bottom kind of center bottom plot shows the scale of the challenge of the multi-jets in gray compared to the um, standard model prediction in blue. And that's a log scale on the y-axis. So this is really quite a challenge. And a uh, interesting thing I noticed that you know both of the experiments do is a projection of how that uncertainty on the multi-jet background affects the, affects the significance that they measure. These are the overall CMS uh, DIHIGS results. This is, um, so the plot on the upper left shows the shape of the cross section with respect to kappa lambda. Again, uh, kappa lambda equals one is the expected value. And you, the, there's a shape in the theoretical prediction and the uh, experimental limits have a slightly different shape resulting in the 
uh, log likelihood curve on the upper right. And you can read off from this both what the 95% confidence li limits are, and you can see how the different analyses contribute both in terms of their different shapes as well as which ones are more sensitive than others with a narrower curve being more, uh, more uh, expected sensitivity. In the table of results on the bottom, I just want to highlight that um, there's also an important role for the B tagging uncertainties. It is the leading experimental uncertainty for the current, for the uh, 4B analysis current, uh, in the most current measurement. And then for the leading channels, the statistical uncertainty is the dominant one. You can see this by comparing 1.4, 1.6, and 1.8 to 1.8 for the two channels with the highest expected significance. For ATLAS, it's a mostly similar set of studies. It's extrapolation from run to analysis, but a smeared truth level simulation for BB gamma gamma. It includes an 8% expected improvement in B tagging efficiency based on the simulation of the new tracker. Uh, the multi-jet uh, background makes the 4B channel very challenging as for CMS. Here's the Atlas versions of the plots of the, the log plot showing the background versus the signal and the projection of how the background modeling uncertainty affects the limits that are seen. Another thing I wanted to point out that I thought was interesting is that in the BB, the BB tau tau analysis based on their run two results highlights the effect of Monte Carlo statistical uncertainties. And most of the, uh, basically every other projection I saw assumes that the uncertainties on Monte Carlo statistics will be zero. But uh, if you see here, there's actually a substantial, if you compare the red dashed and the red dotted lines in the lower left, uh, you can see that there's actually quite a substantial effect from this. And that is consistent with what, uh, what I've seen in a lot of run two analyses. So I believe this is gonna be a significant challenge that is mostly not uh, highlighted. And, uh, but you can see that even, you know, neglecting one across statistical uncertainties, we'll see quite a nice uh, improvement in this measurement going to uh, the high low LHC. Here's the summary slide with the expected significance. Uh, these are very qualitatively similar to the uh, CMS results. So I'm not going, so I'm showing them mostly for completeness. You can see the same features in the cross section plot in the upper right and the limit plot in the lower left and the lower right. Turning now to, you know, not one Higgs, but two Higgs, or not two Higgses, but one Higgs, um, the CMS Higgs couplings. I show here the production modes. We have overall uh, precision in the few percents expected. You can see the error bars for statistical only with the run two systematic uncertainties and then with the more optimistic S2 scenario. And I've pulled the S2 summary table here, and this is kind of a wall of numbers, but I want to highlight a few features. Um, the signal theory uncertainties are in most cases the largest ones, but those also don't affect our knowledge of cross sections. Those come in when we try to compare to the standard model. So while very important, they are in some sense not the focus of the experimental work. Uh, the leading uncertainties in other cases can vary. VBF and ZH associated production remain limited by the statistical uncertainties, but um, uh, ZH, uh, sorry, um, GGH and WH are more limited by the experimental systematics and TTH by the background theory modeling. So that was looking at the measurement of the production modes. We can also factorize separated out by decay channel. And here I want to zoom in on the uh, BB expectation. So uh, this is the number in the plot on the left includes other production modes like VBF and boosted gluon fusion, but the uh, VHBB is the most uh, sensitive of the channels. And so here you can see the leading experimental systematic uncertainty is uh, the B tagging again. So that's, uh, that's the connection all the way back to the detector. When you have four minutes. Right? Okay. For Atlas Higgs couplings, the, so I here have on the same slide, the production mode into K channel. So you could kind of all the information in one go. The, uh, Predictions are shown again for the run two IES one and uh, optimistic S2 scenarios. You can see that the overall uncertainties get down to about four and 5%. The statistical uncertainty is smaller than the system. Uh, the statistical uncertainty is smaller than the systematic uncertainty for all but the very you know, rare channels like mu mu and Z gamma. 
Uh, if you calculate the ratio of the systematic to statistical uncertainty for BB tau tau WW, uh, you see that there's not really one of them more than the other that you would say is you know, the most obviously systematically dominated one. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to look at the limiting factor and the precision for these three different channels because they say they show different things. And in each case, I'm looking at the most sensitive final state for each uh, decay mode. And this is a simplification, but I still think it's instructive. For the diphoton channel, you can see the, you can see the uh, breakdown by production mode here. Only VH is the one is limited by statistics. Everything else is systematics. And I pulled the uh, plot of the nuisance parameter ranking um, from the uh, from the note here for the gluon fusion, which is the most precise of the channels. And there is, this is a very technical plot with a lot of information packed into it. The main thing to notice is that we are focusing on the blue, the blue bars. They use the, the x-axis scale on the top, which gives you their contribution to the fractional uncertainty on the measurement. So the uncertainties at the top are the most important and they decrease as the blue bars get narrower going down. And here you can see that we uh, that the photon isolation efficiency and identification efficiency are leading. And there's also a lot to do with, there are also things to do with a pileup and uh, underlying event. So you can say very, painting with a very broad brush again, but this is limited by understanding of the reconstruction. WW analysis, and uh, I couldn't resist including this because I used to work on this back in the day. Um, this one you can say broadly is limited by the methods where the background estimation is a particular challenge. And to see why you need to actually look at the kinematic distributions. And so I pulled this from the uh, run two result in this channel. And you, can, and you can see from the plot right away that signal to background is about 10% and simple sideband subtraction is not an option the way it would be in the, you know, say the diphoton channel. And here, the, the two ones I want to call out are the teal a color here, that's the, the fake lepton background. This is a notorious challenge. It's about the same size to, as the signal, but uh, difficult to predict. So that's the leading uncertainty. And a little bit further down, you see one of the uncertainties on the WW extrapolation. That's the kind of purpley color. And this is much larger than the signal. So while we know a lot about diboson production, we have to understand this very well to be able to extract this signal. And finally, VHBB, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just say that this is primarily modeled by, the, uh, pr primarily limited by theoretical modeling of the uh, background. So you notice the vector boson transverse momentum in the top rank. Mm -hmm. And B tagging also is not the primary uncertainty here. So this is a counterexample to my earlier claim in a channel where you might expect them to be more of a leading concern. And my two slides remaining. Uh, I do want to highlight that uh, direct searches for beyond standard model extended Higgs sectors are still really interesting and important. Um, the searches that are going expected to improve the most are those which are currently limited by either statistics or the detector capabilities. So I've pulled one example of each from the two experiments. For, for the detector limited ones, I have a, the Atlas prediction for a new heavy scalar decaying to a pair of, a pair of tau tau leptons. And here you can see I've got another rock curve. Uh, in this one, as you go towards the upper upper right, it gets more powerful. And the you can see that, so the run, to, run two performance is the solid line. And most of the HLLHC ones, except for the very forward, exceed that are better performing for the one prong decay. And there's similar plots for two prong. And you can see it here in the improvement compared to the run two uh, run two limits, which compared to, which especially noticing this is a log plot is quite impressive. Another interesting place to go look is in for exotic decays of the existing Higgs boson. And uh, this uh, search from CMS looks for decay to a pair of pseudoscalars, which then decay onwards to tau tau BB or tau tau mu mu. Uh, this, and they, this is interpreted or motivated by a, the two HDM plus singlet model, which is well, well motivated uh, in terms of electroweak baryogenesis, but less constrained than the two HDM by existing measurements. This is another log plot. And you can see that with each step in luminosity, there's a dramatic improvement in the limits. Brings me to my summary. 
um, projected uh, measurements are what motivate us to build new facilities, not just the HLHC, but the ones beyond. Uh, required, but making those projections requires a good understanding of planned detector upgrades, but then we build the detectors motivated by the physics goals. So it's an iterative process. We expect stringent tests of the standard model like observed Higgs boson with three to five percent total uncertainty in the big five decay channel branching ratios. And it's interesting to see the different limitations in different channels. There's no one magic thing we can fix to make these measurements better. It's going to take continued work. Although our projections also always get better as a function of time. I have a couple slides about that in the backup. And so I'm heartened that we will do even better than we were expecting. We expect evidence for Higgs pair production, especially once we combine the two, uh, two uh, experiments. And uh, if there's a non-standard model signal, that'll be very exciting. And that could give us either a larger signal or nothing at all. The next step is, uh, is the resumption of snow mass. There are the two LOIs and both experiments are actively uh, aiming, actively improving the analysis strategies and adding new channels for the next round of prospects. And we're now starting to actually build these detectors and I am looking forward to the data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Corinne. Uh almost ticking to the time. Uh, there are questions already coming up. David, you have the first one. David Antonio. Sorry, I was, I was muted. You mentioned uh, the improved uh, detector timing capabilities, both yes. in Atlas and, and CMS upgrades. Can you comment, can you discuss rapidly which Higgs uh, boson measurements will benefit the most from these improved timing capabilities? And what, what are currently the, the timing resolutions achieved for both detectors? and how they will, for example, quantitatively propagate into for pile-up suppression, to, to mention something. Yeah, so uh, the expected timing resolution for both experiments, at least the goal is 30 picoseconds. And what that does is that allows us to, uh, I, you know, if the projections are, are true, to reduce the pile-up effectively by about a factor of four. So this is something that's going to show up, I would say, across the board rather than in any one particular Higgs projection. I think there was a second part of your question. Yes, I think you answer both. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Antonio, you have the next uh, question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, a terrorist question about the experiment, because now you have uh, really this uh, huge pile-ups which is a gigantic number. And as a theorist, I would naively think uh, now you have much bigger systematic errors. So on one hand side, you improve statistics, but maybe you worse uh, systematic errors. Do you see such cases when systematics errors now will be uh, bigger than in the case of smaller luminosity? Can you comment on this? That's actually, um, at least for, from what I've seen in the Higgs measurements, not really the case because the detectors have been designed from day one with this challenge in mind. And so that's what's driving innovations like the timing layer, as well as the much more you know, aggressive design of the pixel detectors to have a much smaller granularity so that we can you know, pick apart each one of those individual vertices. And there are residual challenges, particularly I think in a jet reconstruction and missing transverse energy, where we don't rely as much on the tracking information, but uh, overall, I think, if anything, the capabilities of the detector are actually going to exceed the current one. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Simona or a comment. Can I, 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 I just wanted to add maybe a quick comment to what uh, Corinne says, since it just I, I work quite a bit on this uh, extrapolation of the systematics for the yellow report. Um, one aspect that it's also interesting to, to keep in mind when we started to dissect sort of the, the, the main contributions is that um, actually statistics plays a big role in the systematics, meaning like that we often try as much as possible to use right our data to build our systematic uncertainties. And in some cases, we are actually limited by the statistics of the data samples we have and they constrain and they, they sort of limit the, uh, the value of the systematics. So they end up blowing up in regions where we start losing statistics. Now, this is not, of course, true for everything. It's true for specific cases. But we were surprised how much this sort of was a recurring uh, aspect. And so when we started dissecting that and sort of extrapolating the statistical component of the systematics down for like having such a large data set, 
it actually it ended up producing a lot of the uncertainty. So that's also a component which might not be obvious, and it was not obvious to us when we started, but it ended up being actually very important. Excellent, Simona, interesting I, point. I, thank you. Thank you for this. I have a quick comment. Quick comment, and maybe it's a question to Antonio or, or Corinne. I, I don't quite know. Uh, basically, you have the broad brush assumption that, uh, at least in the scenario as two, the theoretical uncertainty would be half. Now, in the Higgs case, you have very specific uh, channels. Is that uh, argument still true, or can we be even more ambitious, optimistic, whichever word you you choose? Um, I think. I mean, a lot of these were looked closely at for uh, Higgs decays. And although we have you know, this multiplicity of different final states, they are often affected by common factors for the systematics. And in particular, uh, the PDFs have a pretty, I didn't highlight it in this talk, but the PDF uncertainties become you know, quite important as we start to accumulate more data, but those are themselves expected to um, improve dramatically in the high luminosity LHC because of the added data. And that actually does give you about a 50% improvement. Yeah, I was wondering about the higher order calculations that matter for some of the channels. Uh, what's, what are the pros theoretical prospects? That, Maybe it's not a question for you, but. <laughs> I, I, I would love to know the answer to that question. Okay. Good, uh, there's time to, until we need that precision, but I think it's also, a, a construction site uh, where we need to uh, need some to make some stuff forward. So uh, time is over for this session. Time for coffee, strange coffee, uh, virtually. Uh, pick your cup, uh, and then we're back in thirteen minutes. Uh, thank, thank you. you Thanks to the speakers. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.